Hello everybody, it is me Julian and welcome to the Monday morning live stream philosophy lecture. I'm so glad that you're here. This is going to be a 30 minute live stream lecture in which I try to introduce the concept of the dialectic, more specifically the concept of the Hegelian dialectic. Um, welcome if you're joining me on YouTube or Instagram. These sessions are being broadcast simultaneously. So, hello. Instagram, hello YouTube. If you'd like to watch more of my philosophy videos, those are all available on YouTube. I post a daily 10 minute philosophy explainer, but of course, greetings on Instagram if you're joining me here as well. Uh, please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. Uh, I'm currently in Eastern Washington and happy Easter to those of you who are currently celebrating. Um, there appear to be some complaints about my hair, uh, but my hair has a life and a will of its own, I'm afraid to admit, no matter what I do. Uh, so please, I ask you to make your peace with it uh, as I will, as I will uh, have to do as well. Um, speaking of hair, we will actually be talking about hair and balding seen in the context of the first law of the dialectic, but that will come later. First of all, I'd like to say that the goal of this session and of these videos is to make philosophy a little bit more accessible, but to do it in a way that's hopefully um, not too simple, like that we don't dumb it down too much. So to retain the complexity, but to nevertheless make it accessible. Uh, and what I'd like to do here is I'd like to talk a little bit about the dialectic, and uh, which can be a really abstract idea. And I've made videos on this before, but I think it'd be worthwhile focusing a little bit more on. So. If you'd like to learn about the dialectic and about Hegel, uh, stick around for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, you can also download all of my lectures on Patreon because I record the audio separately. And most of all, thank you for being here today. I appreciate you very much. Okay, let's begin. So, the dialectic. It's a term you may have heard, at least if you studied or read philosophy. And it's used in many different ways, but Perhaps the easiest way to define the dialectic is to say that the dialectic problematizes what appear to be binary opposites. Or perhaps it problematizes the ultimate philosophical binary opposite, namely the relationship between form and content. And so I'd like to begin by saying that form and content are perhaps the two pillars of all philosophical investigation. In fact, if you study literature or art, you'll also be interested in form and content. So let me begin by trying to give you a simple example of how form and content works. Let's say that you go to a museum and you see a painting. Now, usually that painting will be framed. It will have a frame. What you see depicted on or in the painting, like a landscape by Monet, is the content of the painting. Whereas the frame of the painting is the form of the painting. In other words, the form is how the content of the painting is represented. In fact, you could even go a little bit further and say that the stylistic features of the painting, for example, impressionism versus realism, are themselves part of the artistic form that structure the content. For example, if it's an impressionistic painting, it will likely look a little bit more blurry and perhaps have pastel colors. But if it's a realist painting, the edges are going to be more sharp, it's going to be more photorealistic, perhaps using richer contrasts like brown and black and burgundy, what do I know? Therefore, the content is what is being depicted. The form is how it is depicted. And yet, we can even go one level further. Because where are you seeing the painting? In other words, the question as to how you're seeing it, how it is being represented, isn't just in terms of the style of its depiction, nor is it simply in terms of the frame. It is also where and how it is being hung. In other words, the form is also the institution of the museum. The museum has decided that this is a painting worth seeing, perhaps even paying admission for. Therefore, on the level of content, we have the painting and what it depicts. 
a beautiful landscape or a portrait. But on the level of form, we already have at least three layers of presentation, the style, the frame, and then the institution that decides what to present and how. Now, let's make it even a little bit more complicated. Strictly speaking, you could say that there is content in the form. For example, if you go to the Louvre and you look at some of the frames, the wood frames for the paintings, you'll find that the frames themselves contain art. That there were craftsmen who created a frame that was so artistically accomplished that it actually enhances the experience of the painting. In fact, frames like this from the 19th and 18th, 17th centuries can be very valuable in their own right. Therefore, if you took away the painting for a moment and you only had the frame, you would have a kind of content. In other words, what appears to be the neutral frame, the form through which the content of the picture is presented, becomes itself a kind of content. Therefore, already we have here the beginnings of a dialectical relationship between form and content. Now, when I began this lecture, I said that perhaps the simplest way of defining the dialectic is to say that it problematizes form and content, which is to say, not only does it bring them into relation with each other, you become aware of it, it's also about how form can be content. In fact, how form can influence content. Let me give you another example from real life. This is uh, from a wonderful little essay or passage from the writer Susan Zontag. And Susan Zontag was flying on a commercial airplane decades ago when you would still be presented with real silverware, real cutlery. And she said, it's a little bit curious that I'm not allowed to bring a knife on board the plane, but when I'm given cutlery, there is clearly a knife here. In fact, a steel knife. This is pre-9-11 when you could still dine on an airplane. And she asked the stewardess about it, and the stewardess looked at her and said, well, it's common sense, right? It's not a knife. It's part of your cutlery set. And here we have a beautifully dialectical observation, which is to say the form of the representation of the thing overdetermines what its content is. In other words, a knife by itself, or pencil in this case, a knife by itself is considered a threat. In other words, a weapon. The identity of knife, when held up like this, is a weapon, a potential weapon. Whereas a knife used in the kitchen becomes a tool, it becomes an instrument. And a knife used to cut your steak becomes an instrument of civic society, of politesse, a piece of cutlery. Therefore, there's a difference between wielding a knife in battle, wielding a knife in the kitchen, and wielding a knife to show that you have good manners. Fundamentally, therefore, the identity of the knife, its content, what it is, is overdetermined by its structural relationship to the other objects around it. Here we have a dialectical observation, as it were. Knife by itself, potential weapon. Knife in the kitchen, instrument of cooking. Knife next to a fork and spoon, cutlery. Therefore, the fork and spoon are essential to considering the knight, the knife as a piece of cutlery. And Susan Zontag makes a wonderfully dialectical observation about this when she says, you could therefore argue that the spoon is the civilizational gesture as such. After all, even the fork con contains a hint of aggression. You could be impaled upon it. And yet no one can really kill anybody with a spoon. Therefore, the spoon neuters the knife. It neutralizes its threat, and it turns it into, into a mere piece of cutlery. Therefore, you could argue that the context in which the knife is placed creates the identity of the knife. Or, to put it in dialectical terms, the content of the knife, what it is, is overdetermined by the form in which it is presented to you. Now, of course, 
The extrapolation from this idea is therefore that the identity of the individual is also determined by this context. Namely, if you're at table sitting with a knife and fork, you're a civilized person enjoying a nice dinner. But if you show up at an opera wielding a knife, then you become a maniacal potential killer, as it were. Once again, we're talking about the dialectic, which is to say we're talking about the way in which the dialectic is a system, or perhaps method of thought, that problematizes the seemingly binary relationship between form and content. Now, let me expand this for a moment to the idea of ideology and the critique of ideology. The critique of ideology is known, let me put it like this, in, in philosophical terms, the critique of ideology can, put into the, can be put into the following formula, which is to say the critique of ideology is the investigation or the inquiry as to the hidden content in the form itself. Now, that seems quite abstract, but let's go back to my previous example about the museum. Remember, the museum has three formal functions. One, it presents you with an opportunity, i.e. a space, in which to view paintings, which is a wonderful thing, especially if you have the luxury of public museums with free entry. Secondly, the museum creates spaces, literally rooms, in which it curates what can be seen. In other words, there's a selection of their paintings taken from their archive. And finally, on the third level of framing or form, the museum creates art, which is to say it becomes art by virtue of being hung in a museum. And here we've entered into the critique of ideology, which is to say if ideology is the inquiry into the hidden content in the form itself, then the hidden content as to the form of the museum is that the museum isn't simply the neutral arbiter of what is art, but that by means of being in a museum, it becomes art, which is potentially problematic, of course, especially if you're an artist, because then the question becomes, how do you gain the attention of the curator and the critics and potentially an audience so that your art is recognized as such. In other words, we're once, back, once again back at a dialectical inquiry into the nature of content, which is to say, is it art simply because you created it, or is it art because it becomes retroactively designated as art, i.e. being worth seeing or worth hung in a museum? which means that you've created a value system as to what is considered good or bad art, which somehow art should not be about good or bad art. It should be about creative energy, about the human experience. Therefore, the critique of ideology, once again, is to look behind these quote unquote hidden, and yet they're hidden in plain sight, structural, if you will, power structures by which there is a content in the form itself and how it is being presented. I'll give you another example that's perhaps even more contemporary and relatable, namely the algorithm. Whenever you post something on the internet, there are very many different variables that determine whether or not it will be seen by people. Most importantly, the algorithm will decide whether or not it will show your content to other people. And it makes this decision based on a bunch of formal attributes, namely, how long do people watch your video? Do they like it? Do they comment on it? Do they share it? And if people do this, then it is considered engagement, which means that it thinks that it is a video that is likely to draw people's attention. And let's be very clear, there's a difference between quote unquote, good, valuable content and content that draws people attention. And then it spreads it out. And the more it multiplies, the more it further pushes out the content. Now, once again, the critique of ideology would be to say, what is the hidden content in the form itself? In other words, let's peek behind the curtain and see what's happening. Well, first of all, the form over determines the content. For example, if TikTok says, 
only videos that are above 60 seconds long will be monetized, then this means that most people, at least most creators, will start making videos that are above 60 seconds long. Therefore, they have to fill 60 seconds. This means that already the content is being overdetermined, i.e. changed or influenced by the structure, by the hidden form, as it were. Secondly, what I hinted at before, a video that draws engagement will be shared. And yet, engagement isn't just, I like this video. Engagement could also be controversy. If you say something really outrageous or shocking on a video, it's likely to draw heated debates in the comments. The comments will register as increased engagement. Therefore, the video will be pushed out to more people. Once again, this has nothing to do with the content of the video, which the algorithm can't determine, apart from some keywords that it can recognize. Instead, it's all about recognizing a formal structure, which it then rewards with further attention. And this means that we've created, essentially, a social media environment that structurally rewards content that is likely to draw controversy and therefore attention. The reason that I'm bringing this up is that, once again, from a dialectical perspective, it's the form that is interesting, namely the algorithm, and how the form overdetermines the content. You see, traditionally, the idea was always that content was served by the form. In other words, that let's say that you were a painter, that you painted a landscape, and therefore you would put it in a frame, and the frame would accentuate the content. Form was therefore subservient to content. In fact, this goes all the way back to Plato's metaphysical system. Plato believed in the idea of an ideal essence, as it were, what he called an idea. Let's say that you have a pencil, and the pencil contains within it the form of the pencil. What you are seeing right now is the form of the pencil. And Plato believed that there was a mystical, metaphysical essence or idea of the pencil that existed beyond or within it. Therefore, the form was the phenomenal object, i.e. what appeared to us through sight and conceptual reason. And the goal was to transcend, hence transcendental idealism, to access the idea of it, the ultimate mystical blueprint, as it were. And Plato used the allegory of the cave as a way to illustrate this. If you're not already familiar with it, the allegory of the cave states that mankind is trapped in a cave and we're sitting with our backs against the great fire. And the backs uh, and the fire behind our backs is casting shadows upon the cave wall and we're transfixed by these shadows. It's like we're watching TV. And the task of the philosopher is to be the one who exits the cave in fact, Plato writes that one day the philosopher will be dragged out of the cave. We don't know by who. Aliens, maybe. And then, having seen the truth outside the cave, essence or the ideal, he can then return back into the cave so as to help the others escape the cave as well. Now, on the one hand, this is a simple allegory of individual emancipation. After all, perhaps one of the key definitions of philosophy is that we take a step back and we start to question what appears to exist as given, which is to say in psychoanalytic terms that we question the existing master signifiers that tell us how to live. There were philosophies about taking a step back. It's about being able to reflect or exiting the cave and therefore perhaps helping other people to do so as well. And yet Plato was also making a metaphysical argument about the relationship between content and form. The simplest way to put it is like this. Plato believed that everything you could see in the world, everything that you could think, everything that appeared to you, the phenomena, were form, essentially. This was the form of the appearance of the ideal. And that within or outside these forms was essence. Therefore, Plato created a metaphysical binary system between essence and appearance, between truth and falsehood. And this metaphysical system then became the metaphysical system that governed all philosophical inquiries, which is to say, 
the goal of philosophy became to leave the world of illusions behind and enter into the world of truth. Or, to put it in dialectical terms, to leave behind the content, as uh, leave behind the form, and to enter into the ideal content. However, as we've already seen in the examples of the museum or the cutlery, the preliminary gesture of dialectics is to suggest that form and content are not neutral. They're not binary opposites. They're not something that exists completely outside each other. That there is a form that determines the content and that there is a content in the form. And here we have what is essentially the beginning of dialectics, namely the content in the form and the form in the content. I'll, I'll give you another example, this time from the uh, supposed first law of the dialectic, which is formulated by Engels. But we can also see antecedents, uh, like predecessors, foreshadowings of this, even in like uh, Zeno and the paradoxes of Zeno, etc. The law works like this. It's supposed to be the transition from quantity into quality and vice versa. I'll give you a very simple and hopefully intuitive example. If you're somebody who is going bald or has gone bald, then you realize that there is a difference between hair loss and at a certain point being declared bald. However, strictly speaking, to be bald doesn't mean that you don't have any hairs on your head. It's that at a certain point, you've decided, well, I'm going bald, so I might as well shave my head. Now I am bald. And one of the observations going all the way back to the paradoxes of Zeno is this transition from quantity into quality, which is to say, at what point does the individual loss of hairs amount to the quality of being bald? No one can determine this exactly. It's a little bit like when you see one of those jars and it says you can win a prize if you guess how many marbles are in the jar. It's almost impossible to do. It's very difficult to say at what point exactly, I, how many hairs do you have to lose before you are considered bald. In fact, I think for a lot of people who are going bald, this creates a lot of understandable anxiety, which is to say, I'm losing my hair, but at what point does it look like I haven't realized I'm losing my hair? Like, at what point should I step in and just come out, as it were, as bald? For Zeno, going all the way back to Zeno's paradoxes, we have here a similar version, except it's not about balding, it's about uh, a grain or a kernel of sand becoming a pile of sand. Essentially, the argument works like this. If you take a kernel or a grain of sand and you add it to another grain of sand, you have two grains of sand. In other words, you have a quantity of sand. Let's say that you add three and four and 400, 500 grains of sand. You're still talking about quantity. And yet, at a certain point, you're not talking about something countable, i.e. grains or kernels of sand, at a certain point it becomes a pile of sand, a heap of sand, a dune of sand. In other words, at a certain point, we have a transition from quantity into quality, namely from individual kernels of sand into the quality of a pile of sand. The same thing is true, like I said, with balding. At a certain point, you have individual hair loss, and you've lost enough hairs that you are considered bald. A transition from quantity, hairs, into a quality, bald. Now, on a philosophical level, and this is a little bit more abstract, so bear with me, we have here not just a transition from quantity to quality, but more specifically, the transition from particular to universal which is to say quantity is always about a particular amount. One hair, two hairs, one grain of sand, two grains of sand. And yet what happens is that at a certain point, this particular quantity becomes a quality, namely something which isn't countable anymore. It becomes an abstract name for that which is no longer seeable in its particularity. In other words, a pile of sand, you can't count how many kernels there are. You are bald. You have lost sufficient hairs to simply consider yourself bald 
even if you're still losing here. Therefore, one of the laws of the dialectic, the first law of the dialectic, as illustrated by Engels, is the transition from quantity to quality and vice versa. Now, of course, if you're bald, it's unlikely that you will grow hair again. I'm not going to sell you a magic solution for this. Um, although if you've watched the latest Willy Wonka movie, uh, there appears to be a cure called the hair repair eclair, which I think is a quite wonderful idea. But the point about the transition from quantity to quality and vice versa essentially is supposed to say that the relationship between form and content, namely the relationship between the particular and the universal, is never stable. In fact, it's unstable. The two are related to each other. Their identity is not an identity of unity apropos each other, but an identity of difference apropos each other, which is to say they wouldn't exist without each other. And here we have the transition from binary to antinomy to dialectic, which is to say a binary is simply two things that are opposites, like apples and oranges, but they don't need each other to exist. You have apples and you have oranges. An antinomy becomes related to each other, day and night, truth and lies. Therefore, a lie is something which is no longer true. Night is when it is no longer day. They become antinomically attached to each other, which is to say they require conceptual reason to impose a system of impossibility upon them. The dialectical version is to say that they are always already overdetermined by each other. No content without form and no form without content. Therefore, the dialectic essentially problematizes the binary notion of opposites by means of going through or beyond the antinomical notion of something which is posited as a rational impossibility. Therefore, at a very basic level, the idea of the dialectic is to reject the notion of one or unity, that something exists in an ideal or idea of itself, as Plato would say. Now, I want to end briefly, and I know this is a lot, and we'll continue this next week if you're interested. I'd like to end briefly with a wonderful observation made by the um, writer and philosopher Frederick Jameson, who in his book, The Valences of the Dialectic, which I think I have somewhere. Let me get it. The Valences of the Dialectic, um, you can see it, has a wonderful opening chapter where he talks about the three names of the dialectic. First of all, he says, there's something distinctly undialectical about trying to teach or write about the dialectic in any formal ways. Like trying to break it down into bullet points is itself undialectical. After all, the dialectic is about how things, uh, how it, we have an identity of difference that overdetermines the content of what a thing is. But he attempts to come up with a formula of sorts for how the dialectic has been viewed, at least historically. And he says the three names of the dialectic are as follows. We have dialectic as system, dialectic as method, and what you might call dialectic as ideology. And I'd like to very briefly lay out what he means by that, and we can end there and we can pick it up next week. So dialectic as system is a reference to the Hegelian dialectic. Hegel was perhaps the greatest systematizer to have ever lived in philosophy. Essentially what that means is that Hegel tried to create a system of philosophy whereby philosophy, philosophy wasn't simply applied to the world, but everything was applied to his philosophy, as it were. Now Hegel's often accused of being a solipsistic thinker for this very reason, and yet nothing could be less true. Hegel wasn't trying to create a system in which everything fit his predetermined logic. Instead, he was trying to create a system that would include even that which could not be included in his logic, which is a much more ambitious goal. It's like Flaubert, who once said that he wanted to write a book about nothing, that he wanted to find a book whose content was a form of nothingness, a kind of void, as it were. And Hegel is quite Flaubertian in this sense, which say that Hegel's system of philosophy is a system of that which exceeds or goes beyond such a system. Jameson, Frederick Jameson likens Hegel's system to 
a piece of music that you can't take in bit by bit, but you have to go through the entire score to have the cumulative effect of it, as it were. Like, you can't just skip to the end of a Beethoven piece. You have to listen to the whole thing to really enjoy it and relish it. Therefore, Hegel is a systematizer in the sense that his dialectical system was about the creation of a system of openness, of radical um, undeterminedness, which is to say that Hegel's often miscast as being a unitary thinker of the one, a mystical absolute, a solipsist. And instead, Hegel's theory was about a system that was constantly opening up, like a, an Ouroboros, not just eating its own tail, but in a sense both growing and shrinking at the same time, something which defied any kind of formalism as such. And we can return to that in another video, I'd be happy to. Then we have a dialectical method, and arguably Marxism, or at least dialectical materialism, and the attempt to therefore create a philosophy of Marxism was the use of dialectics, not just as a system of thought, in other words, a system of the dialectical relationship between identity and difference, and perhaps how identity always already in includes and precludes difference, into a method of analysis by which dialectics could be used to study economics and history and politics, I suppose you could say, as well. Therefore, a lot of the dialectical principles of Hegel's system find their way into the dialectical analysis that of Marxism and the method of Marxism. Again, I can return to this in another video, I would be happy to. And finally, Jameson says that the three names of the dialectic, namely the system of the dialectic, the method of the dialectic, has to be followed by the ideology, the critique of ideology as a form of the dialectic. And as I said earlier in this video, the critique of ideology, in its most formal sense, is the inquiry into the hidden content in the form itself. Therefore, the critique of ideology is a form of dialectical analysis. The example that I gave at the beginning of this video was how a knife by itself is a potential weapon, but when it is added to cutlery, it becomes a tool of civilizational participation, fine dining, as it were. Therefore, the identity of the knife is overdetermined by its structural relations to its surroundings, to its context. And therefore, we've taken what is the original idea of Hegel's dialectical system, which is to say that instead of unity versus difference, essence versus appearance, we have only difference, namely unity or one is always already negated or differentiated through its other which again, I can return to in another video because I know it's very abstract, then the method of dialectics, which for Marx is about a theory of history and the unfolding of economic and structural power relations seen through the dialectic, which nevertheless is a method, i.e. it applies the dialectic to the study of these trends. I'll give you an example, I realize. One of Marx's key arguments is that the tra transition from feudalism to capitalism was supposed to liberate people from the uh, master-bondsman relationship. In other words, instead of being a lord or a peasant, you were supposed to be a free individual participating in what would become an open or free market of exchange. However, Marx argues that what happens is that this, the governing principles of feudalism, of the master-bondsman relationship, are maintained in capitalism, except now they are disavowed, which is to say there is nevertheless extreme power and wealth inequality, but the governing ideology is that you are free to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, as it were. Now, we can make the transition to the critique of ideology as being the final name of the dialectic. Namely, if the critique of ideology is about the hidden content in the form itself, well, that's really what Marx was already doing with his method, which is to say, if the content of feudalism, namely the unjust, unequal relationship between the master and the bondsman, between the lord and the serf, is disavowed, i.e. maintained, but reified in its supposedly opposite guise, namely individual emancipation by means of economic advancement, then therefore the content of feudalism exists in the form or persists in the form of capitalist relations. And so we have a transition from the Hegelian system of dialectics, which is the most abstract version of dialectics, which is a metaphysical relationship, 
towards the method of Marxism and then the contemporary critique of ideology, which extrapolates from both Hegel and Marx the inquiry as to the hidden content in the form itself. This is why Frederick Jameson argues that perhaps the contemporary version of dialectical analysis is precisely about de-reification, or if you want to put it in more French structuralist terms, about demystification, looking behind the veil, as it were. Now, this has been my attempt to give you, in a very straightforward uh, way, the basic components of dialectics. However, I've tried to retain some of the complexity whilst using accessible examples. And my hope is that this will be an invitation to you to want to learn more about this and perhaps pick up your own reading or participate in more of my classes. These lectures are open access. They're free for anybody to watch. I'll save them on both Instagram and YouTube. You're also invited to join me on YouTube where I post daily bite-sized 10-minute explainers. The goal of this project is to hopefully respect your intelligence sufficiently to want to share in philosophical learning with you rather than to try to impart upon you simplified versions of what is a very deeply enriching and joyful experience, at least I believe. A thank you to our patrons who continue to make this open access educational project possible in the first place. And if you'd like to support my lectures, please consider becoming a patron where you can also find further educational materials. Thank you so much, and I will see you tomorrow.